Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our last session before lunch. Uh, my name is Nancy Wilkins Deer from the San Diego Supercomputer Center. This is going to be our first of several lightning talk sessions. Lightning talk sessions are uh, really exciting, interesting sessions. You'll get a lot of information in a short period of time. Each of our presenters is going to speak for 10 minutes on their topic. We'll hold all the questions to the end to the end and likely going into lunch because of um, the way the schedule is um, so far. So each of our presenters will introduce themselves and they're going to uh, you know, shift rapidly from one to the other. I'll be timing them and we'll have them uh, uh, get their, uh, their information across to you in, uh, in a compressed and interesting way. So with that, um, we'll let Eric go as our first speaker. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Shook. I come from the Department of Geography at Kent State University. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about a new programming language uh, that we've been developing as a collaborative effort with a number of individuals uh, to help lower the barriers to entry for cyber GIS. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a number of people. Um, they aren't authors on the paper of the presentation because I'm presenting some ideas that weren't vetted by them and I didn't want my crazy ideas associated with their nice names. Um, so if you disagree with some of the ideas, it was probably mine. If you thought the idea was good, it was probably one of these folks. Um, so to get started, I want to give a little bit of a background, especially for our, our computational science friends in the audience, on cartographic modeling. Uh, this was a conceptual framework uh, introduced by C. Dana Tomlin in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and it really kind of captures uh, or gives a conceptual framework for spatial data processing. And it starts with a procedure, which is a sequence of operations. Computational scientists would probably call this a workflow. Operations input and output map layers, generally 2D rasters, but could also be points or polygons. The operations themselves can be classified as local, focal, zonal, or global. And this really, this really uh, describes the spatial extent when you're calculating an individual location within a layer. Uh, whether you're going to look at just the values at that location or potentially neighboring locations. And then embedded within the operation is the function itself. This is where you're actually doing the calculations in the individual locations, which give the power of spatial data processing. So if you're trying to incorporate something like cartographic modeling into a cyber GIS where you're really trying to leverage parallel and high-performance computing systems, you run into three fundamental problems. So first, where does it fit? Within the conceptual framework, there's no real space because we go directly from layer to location to incorporate something like spatial domain decomposition, the standard way that we would tend to decompose a 2D raster to fit it onto a parallel architecture, right? Um, and even if we had that space, it's really complex to implement. It's a little, uh, I would say, above the threshold of typical GI scientists to be able to implement spatial domain decomposition, manage all of the parallel executions, et cetera, et cetera. And that makes the third really difficult, right? So we've been talking about developing a pipeline of professionals and incoming students into this domain, and it's very difficult to teach these concepts, as I ran into in my cyber GIS class last spring. So to help overcome some of these challenges, we've been developing the Parallel Cartographic Modeling Language, PCML. Uh, it's an embedded programming language within uh, Python. And it was, base, uh, it was created based on three design goals, usability, programmability, and scalability, in that order meaning that we will not sacrifice usability or programmability for scalability, hoping to make a very usable language, very easy to understand, very easy to teach language. Uh, I can't get into the details due to the time, but I'd like to give a couple of highlights. It extends the cartographic modeling framework, which is familiar to most GIS students. It's implemented in Python, easy to use, easy to program. It's already available in GitHub. It's a very alpha release, but it's in, under active development. And the, the last bullet point I think is the most important probably to this audience. It supports automatic parallelization. And this is how we can have it be usable and programmable um, for, for students. So how can we do this? First, we introduce a concept of a subdomain, while not necessarily novel, introducing it into the cartographic modeling framework along with a number of other model operators uh, enables PCML to be a little simpler than, than previous languages. And subdomains for this language really serve as the elemental unit of parallel computation. So it enables us to talk about performance gains balanced through parallelism, increasing the spatial do domain decomposition, breaking it up into smaller and smaller bits onto more and more processor cores, which is what, is what we've been talking about over the past couple of days, with 
kind of algorithmic optimizations, those kind of code fiddling that you tend to do uh, on, the, on a single processing core, right? So the upper half is parallelism, the bottom half tends to be your algorithmic optimizations. It kind of gives a nice uh, simple boundary. Uh, for the language. We also introduce a number of other uh, model operators. A scheduler manages the parallel execution of a procedure. Decomposition manages uh, our, is how we decompose a layer into one or more subdomains. Uh, we have an executor which manages the processing of subdomains. Just as you have an operation to a layer and a function to a location, you have an executor to a subdomain. We also introduce iteration. The ordering that you process individual locations within a subdomain can influence uh, the overall performance. So making this explicit in the language has been very important. So to give a very simple example to kind of illustrate the idea, and we can talk more uh, offline, you can find me afterwards. We have a six line example implementing local sum in PCML. The first line, you classify your operation, local, focal, zonal, or global. This gives us information to determine decomposition, right? Uh, the second one, we're going to name our operation or our function, in this case, local sum. It's going to take self, which if you're not used to Python is very common. It, I know it looks strange. It takes a list of locations that we're going to process and a list of subdomains associated with those locations in case if we need additional information. Then we're going to, in this case, loop over all of the locations in our list, extract the value v, add it to our sum, which will be ultimately returned. We can use it just like any other Python function after writing those six lines, local sum, layer A, layer B, layer C, and you get automatic parallelization. So it scales nearly linearly up to eight cores, so on most desktops and laptops it'll scale very well, and that starts to taper off a little bit, something that I'll be working on uh, in the future uh, to in increase the, the scalability of it. But as an alpha release, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy with this so far. Um, kind of extracting this out from our example, if you look at it in terms of the process of PCML, you can see that we're starting with our, our uh, local sum, so we're adding the red layer to the blue layer through an operation, and then it goes through a decomposition step. Each operator in PCML can be overridden by a user or a developer. If you don't like the decomposition step that's already available, you can use a different one. So if you can go from grid to row to column, if you don't like any of those, write one yourself. You take in uh, a layer, you return a list of subdomains, and you can have your own decomposition strategies. Same goes for scheduler, executor. If you don't like Python, if it's too slow for you, re-implement one in C++, or re-implement one in CUDA in order to leverage those graphics processing units and get the major speed up. Because subdomains are the elemental unit of parallel computation, Whatever happens below the executor really doesn't matter to the rest of the framework. So it enables us to leverage multiple languages and gain the performance without necessarily making it more complex for the user. Um, you can change the iteration strategy. You want to go from row prime to something like space filling curves and really uh, leverage that spatial locality for, for your algorithms, no problem. So for example, a researcher or a student could implement global min distance. This is where you're calculating the nearest distance uh, to a point for every cell in your raster. In about 10 lines of PCML code, you could implement this. And then instead of, change, or instead of returning the distance, you could change one line of code and return the index to the, to the actual point. And now suddenly we're talking about Voronoi diagrams and Thiessen polygons. Another change in, in code, uh, one, one single line, you can change the distance function. Instead of using Euclidean distance, we can talk about Manhattan distance and a number of other distance functions and how they can influence the output of our individual operations. And you're not stuck to one operation. You can do this with any of them because all of the code is exposed. So suddenly students can look at the operation themselves. They can make small modifications to the code. They can see the output instantaneously. This also works for parallelization. You can change the decomposition strategy and compare the performance. Now, one thing that I want to spend uh, a minute on um, is something that's kind of been boiling around in my head as we've been working on this language, uh, is actually broadening it out. So cartographic modeling was introduced uh, as kind of a conceptual framing for spatial data processing, right? Uh, when when C. Dana Tomlin introduced it, he introduced it from the perspective of a typical user, somebody who wants to create a procedure to take map layer inputs A, right? and go through a sequence of steps and output a whole bunch of map layer outputs B, right? But from a cyber GI scientist, a computational geographer, a geoinformaticist, whatever you want to call them, 
our focus generally is something a little bit different. Here we're, of course, interested in the applications, but we're also interested in the scheduling, the decomposition strategies, the execution strategies, the iteration strategies, and the, the, the interplay between the spatial characteristics of the data, the parallel and computing performance of the computers, and what that means. So something that has been boiling around in my mind is creating a parallel cartographic modeling framework in, in order to really frame some of the discussions that we've been kind of thinking through through this, um, through this conference. And of course, just like cartographic modeling, it's not going to work for every problem. It's not going to work for every single case. But I do think that it might give us kind of a base frame that we could start really honing in some of these discussions, at least from a common uh, vocabulary. And with that, I think that my 10 minutes up. So I'd like to thank you for, for your attention. And I'll take questions either at the end, or you can hunt me down uh, later today or tomorrow. Thank you. Ninh Chuan Xia. I'm from the Ohio State. I don't think the mic. Can you turn this off? The mic. Is it better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, now I can hear myself. <laughs> okay, my name is Ninh Chuan Xia. I'm from Ohio State University. And uh, uh, before I start this, let me uh, confess this. So uh, when I uh, submit the paper to this conference, so I didn't really know what geo design is. So after having sitting in a sitting in this uh, room for a couple of days, now I I I, I got the idea. So I don't think it's a stretch to make a statement like this. So we are living in the world uh, in in the world of geography that is designed, and very often these designs are arbitrarily done. Now what do we mean by that is you know uh, you probably are in a county and uh, the county boundaries, you know, they are artificial in, in a sense. Uh, it could be drawn in a different way. Now, uh, we are making maps of using census geographies. Now, all those boundaries can be drawn in a totally different way, and there might be a many, many different uh, spatial configurations of those things. And of course, you know, we vote every, every few years, and there is something called a congressional district. And that is an American thing, and uh, that is drawn arbitrarily. So, um, so, 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 uh, so that's what I mean. It's not a stretch. It's actually real. Uh, so, spatial aggregation is one of those designs, uh, including what I have just said. Uh, you know, census tracts, which is basically the uh, spatial aggregation of census blocks and census gr block groups. Now, uh, congressional districts are the aggregation uh, constitutionally of census blocks, right? So some different states might have different you know, requirements, but uh, overall, they are still aggregation of, this, of spatial units. Uh, so here comes to uh, the problem, of course. So there are many possible ways for you to redraw the, uh, the boundary, and therefore, you will have different kinds of spatial patterns or even the conclusions. So for example, if you make a map of the uh, population density using the census tracts, nobody's doing that, but some might. So um, you might realize that the census tracts might have a different look if the boundaries are drawn differently. So even for the census blocks, which of course we don't get more detailed data, but apparently it can be drawn differently. So uh, we would be wondering, uh, are there you know, better ones whatever you mean by better, right? So are there, there must be someone that are out there that is at least not worse than what we are using. Uh, for example, congressional districts. Uh, you know, there are lawsuits every once in a while, and apparently there are different ones that people th would see uh, from different angles. So, um, so the questions would be, you know, how many are those things? And uh, uh, there are many of them, so I use plural, right? So, uh, and uh, how to find them? efficiently. So uh, it's not like you know, we want to find one optimal uh, spatial configuration, which may not exist. But uh, the matter of fact is, there might exist many, many different, uh, a diverse set of optimal spatial configurations. 
and that's the problem. So um, once I, uh, you know, since I'm here, I want to warn you that I'm not going to present any solutions that come with the problems. Uh, so, uh, so how many spatial aggregations? Well, that's a question depending on how the spatial units are connected with each other. Now, if they are all fully connected, that means one unit is connected with every one, every other unit. Uh, then the total number would be what we call a sterling number of the second kind, which is a huge number. You will see it a little bit later. Now, so that's the upper bound. So you can get more connected than that. Now, there's a lower bound. If all those units are linearly distributed, so um, no more unit, uh, so each unit has no more than two connected uh, neighbors. So in that case, uh, the, the, the number is lower, uh, is lower and it is a, uh, as what we would call a, a n minus one choose k minus one. And there are some other numbers. I'm not going to go to uh, uh, that one for, for, for more detail. So uh, this one shows you the number of to total districts, which is the big N, and uh, I mean the number of total units, which is the big N, and the number of districts or uh, aggregations you want to make. So uh, for, 50, for 50 spatial units, to aggregate them into five, you are upper bound. You are looking at the upper bound of 10 to the power of 32. Uh, increase this one to 300, and we are looking at two to the power of 207. And you can see this thing goes uh, exponentially when the, n num uh, the number of n increases, and the 10 to the power of 400. What does that mean? That means you won't, you won't be able to see the, all the spatial congregations in in, in the lifetime of human beings, probably. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, let's put this into a perspective. Uh, one year has, uh, the power, has less than the power, uh, 10 to the power of eight seconds. So uh, if you are able to handle, uh, you know, 10 to the power of 32, uh, you know, districts, spatial aggregations in one second. Now you are looking at uh, so if the total number increased to uh, 300, you are looking at you know 10 to the power of 170 some years, which is a lot of time. So uh, so what I mean by complexity of spatial aggregation, this is it. So uh, this is a huge number of possible aggregations uh, we are looking at, and of course it all comes down to the computational problem because we still want to find the other ones. You don't want to be handed down by some other people, this is the, you know, uh, uh, congressional districts you have to vote for. Uh, there might be some other uh, alternatives. Now to solve the problem, we can um, look at the problem as an exact, uh, as an optimization problem, and then we'll, we probably, well, we can solve them using what we call the exact methods, uh, but there are, soon you will see that is miserable, uh, it, it, it won't help. So uh, we will look at some ways, sort of the intelligent, I'm not going to say this is intelligent design, but it's uh, intelligent uh, search methods for us to find different kinds of spatial aggregation, uh, spatial configurations. And, uh, and then the last thing, uh, uh, the last way we solve this, which has been done very often, is humans. Uh, now, we always are talking about the humans are competing with the computers, and this time around, actually, is the computers, we want computers to compute, compete with the humans. Now, if you look at this, okay, uh, uh, congressional districts around the country, there are a, a, a few states, they have perfect uh, congressional districts. That means the maximum difference of people between districts is one person, right? So uh, algorithms right now cannot do that, but still, uh, let's see about you know how algorithms can do. So this is a, a table that tells us how we can do with using the exact methods. Uh, all those italic numbers are the uh, are the ones with different configurations of a different number of units. Uh, this means you know we can find any good solution in one day. And it's probably it won't happen in the next day or next hundred days. Uh, so uh, exact method is probably uh, we should write off. Now, uh, now, you know, so we developed a method called a give and a take. Basically, we, we, 
we uh, draw a line and we swap, we swap between the units. Uh, and uh, this is one of the examples uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to use. So this is a hypothetical population, total population. And we are going to create 100 units uh, based on this side's population so that we want to equalize the population between those units. And then we are going to look at a second population. So this might be total population. And this is, might be the minority population. So um, there are, so here's the result. And, uh, and this one shows you uh, different, two kinds of different plants where, um, you know, how the uh, uh, minority population uh, would be mapped out. And uh, apparently, if you compare this map to uh, this map, the pattern is similar. Okay, if you, you, if you hold this one as the truth, this one would be the artifacts. And uh, you can see some kind of, you know, the centers might, be, might shift around, and the patterns might be different. Now, the, these are only two examples. There are hundreds of those things, uh, as you can imagine. So um, my algorithm, uh, so our algorithm, I should say, uh, right now can handle this one in one minute. This is 1,000 units uh, for 100, uh, to aggregate to 100 units. Now I feel like you know this is probably the uh, bottleneck we are looking at uh, because we are we, we need we need to generate hundreds and hundreds of those things so it takes a lot of time, so um, so I think somehow the uh, hyper uh, this the cyber GS perspective might be super helpful for us to provide a so um, to provide the context of spatial aggregation. So given one, you might want to see how many others are out there. And are there any other ways for us to make a map that might give us a different conclusion? Uh, so well, there, are, there have been many search, search algorithms out there. And uh, I think we have, we have seen uh, yesterday about you know, genetic algorithms. Uh, myself, has some, uh, I have some hands-on experience with that. And uh, uh, all of those are not geared up to handle real problems. So for example, the real problem would be in Franklin County in Ohio, it has 22,000 uh, census blocks, and we only, only have you know, hundreds of census tracts. We are going to aggregate you know, 20,000 units into a few hundred. And that is one of the prob uh, problems. So looking at the entire Ohio, uh, if you, we are looking at all kinds of different possible congressional districts plans, uh, the problem is even bigger. Um, so it's a big challenge. I think uh, we are, uh, you know, I'm op optimistic about this because of the uh, uh, advance in computing power and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the new development of the algorithms. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I definitely need to put this uh, slide, uh, slide here to uh, acknowledge my um, partners. Thank you very much. <laughs> So, um, okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Moonin Wen. I'm coming from the one we call domain scientists. I'm from the School of um, Environmental, well, Forest and Environmental Science, University of Washington. So, um, compared to those um, computational wise uh, speech we heard um, a lot, um, just want to apologize here. I'm not going to give you another um, really exciting computational advancement here, but I'm trying to explore um, the capability of using CyberGIS um, doing the case synthesis to exploring the spatial dynamic, um, spatial temporal dynamic of the sustainable systems. So the outline here I'm going to present includes what actually the sustainable system we are looking for here. Um, the case synthesis, what the 
is our data set. Um, what is the purpose, the method, and the workflow out of that? Um, since we are also talking about the spatial temporal dynamics, we know there are uh, the geo design um, for the thinking process or the models. There is a cyber GIS which provides a really great high performance, high collaboration environment. So we are trying to do those conceptualized uh, comparisons and figure out what is the strengths and future extension that cyber GIS can provide if we are doing the case analysis, if we are cultivating uh, the knowledge from the cases. So um, thanks for like the yesterday, the keynote speak, Jack, um, for the understanding, you know, how complex the environmental issues can be. Uh, the Louis um, providing the full full supply, full security, uh, great talk about that. Um, here I want to give you a concept, conceptualize what is the sustainable system we're trying to discover here. It's a human nature interactions. So we start to observe, uh, observe those phenomena we observe from those environments. We figured out there are some interactions between the um, between the formulas, but what those relationship really is, what is um, those spatial dynamic uh, content enabled in those um, relationships? There are three. Well, we can just really simplify that into three type of. Um, skills to researching those sustainable systems. For the global scale systems, as you, as you can see, we're trying to depict, we're trying to find the common phenomenon out of those systems. Um, however, when we're trying to understand, trying to simplify those, we are also lack of in-depth insights. So some researchers are actually taking another route um, to understand the case scale uh, on the other hand, trying to provide what the in-depth um, insights really is. But, you know, like uh, I joined the workshop in the big data and I feel like it's a similar metaphor here uh, between those case skills and the big data. We are trying to actually figuring out the meaningful presentation, uh, representations or figuring out the meaningful patterns out of those big data. Um, here we have the simil similar um, purpose here by doing the case synthesis is trying to actually aggregate or um, figuring out the patterns from those cases and seek for more generality out of that. The Ostrons and um, her teams actually use the case study method to conduct a cross case um, comparisons to discover the phenomenon, construct the patterns depicting those sustainable systems. But besides of that, um, we f also find the systematic review and the meta analysis is, are widely used in the medical um, health, nursing, or social works. Um, environments, trying to understand, trying to cultivate uh, the evidence uh, and to s either to support or against the theoretical or clinical propositions they propose there. Um, as you can see, the systematic review, trying to figure out a systematic way to um, rank, to interpret uh, the qualitative materials. On the other hand, the meta-analysis using the statistical method, trying to pull the similar uh, studies for a si significant testing. Even though those three um, methods are really different, they do share some common workflow out of that. I apologize with uh, those small font for those workflow, but trying to explain that in the conceptually and welcome to the poster um, or trying to find me after the talk, we, we can talk about that more. So it's actually three 
key components like any research process, we are trying to depict what questions we're trying to answer, but still provide a comparable um, fundamental background for if we are compare one case synthesis versus another. So the first thing here is trying to depict the meta categories. And by using the tree mode modes, like who is the control measures and what variable we are trying to observe to get a refined research questions. Or if you don't really have that yet, it's also available for you to start with a general research purpose, but trying to depict finding the patterns once you discover those cases. So the the second case for case collections and organizations, as you can see, I will treat that as a decomposing process of those cases by using the unit of analysis. And um, so we are basically taking those case contents into different pieces and uh, reorganizing them based on the coding framework we had um, in a large scale of the research, there is a case database should be built, or if you are researching on complex relationship, a chain of evidence might be um, another ways to organize your information. The last portion of that is the uh, analysis and synthesis process, which we are trying to make those decomposing pieces into reassemble them in the way where we can find the patterns, we can find uh, the similarities, the differences out of that by get um, the visualizations um, to understand what is the nature going on there. So, uh, so those workflows doesn't really share any spatial temporal contents to it. So we also take a look what if we want to depict the spatial temporal relationship um, out of that. So we trying to explore the comp capabilities among the case synthesis workflow, the geo designs and the cyber GIS. Um, by comp coupling and comparing the concept of that, we found the geo designs for the representation models. Even most geo design projects has the predefined questions. The representation model is also a way where you refine your questions, where you understand the nature of your cases. The process model, however, it's a ways to decomposing it, understand the process underneath uh, those cases. For those patterns, finding matchings, you can use the change impact models to um, understand the content and even make the decision out of that. By exa examining the cyber GIS environments and what it can provide us, the high performance and high collaboration, as I mentioned before, the cyber GIS gateway and structured participation toolkit did provide uh, the potential for following functionalities. We cannot actually come up with a research question if we want to do a really large scale um, case synthesis. Um, there is high performance collaboration needs to be made. And the meta category, the coding framework, even though visualizing those systems to define how we aggregate them, are actually need to rely on the cyber GIS uh, to provide the high capability to s initiate and to start with those collaborations. We also found there is a really key component in the case synthesis is trying to depict those uh, relationships from the ph phenomenon and also matching those relationships among different cases. Um, there is, we're trying, I'm trying to actually discover what is out there, um, maybe lack of my limited knowledge and uh, the understanding of the cyber GIS. We 
haven't find a really specific toolkit that actually help us to do that. Um, however, there is the theoretical foundations. Um, the Moser framework did provide the spatial temporal relationship among the sustainable systems, which can be used as a foundation to developing um, a cyber GIS tools in the future. And thank you. And sorry for the acknowledgement. Um, thank you for the funding um, agencies for that, yeah, to make this trip work. Thank you. And can everybody hear me? Okay. For the ones that I haven't met, uh, my name is Gonzalo Espinosa. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm presenting a statistical analysis and, um, of the soil moisture in, in Texas. So the motivation behind this work was that, um, uh, to change a little bit the, the workflow that we use in civil engineering. Um, different from you, I, I, I'm more in a, I have a background of civil engineering, so I'm approaching cyber GIS from the application side instead of uh, from the computer science side. side. So in this case, um, I realized that most of the, my colleagues or my, uh, my colleagues at the University of Austin uh, follow the, the procedure on the left. We get the data sets through web services. We do a process, process it or an analysis and publish the results, maybe in a journal, maybe in a web, uh, in a web page, but they are static. So my idea is to uh, use this data set and the web services that are always evolving in a dynamic way. Uh, so through a web application that updates itself uh, when new data is available. So uh, for the data, uh, for the soil moisture in Texas, I'm using the um, data from LDAS. LDAS is a land assimilation system. It's a land surface hydrologic model from NASA. And it comes in different flavors. So there is the GLDAS from global uh, data, NLDAS from national data for the US, and also they have um, several variables from soil moisture, evapotranspiration, surface runoff, all the variables that uh, people in hydrology are interested in. So the one that I'm using is uh, the, the national model, the NOAA model, and I'm, use, I'm uh, analyzing the soil moisture in the top meter uh, of the soil. So how much water is in the top meter of soil? And I'm using hourly and monthly data, and I'm using mo uh, daily data, sorry, and um, the cell size is one eighth of a degree, that it means uh, 14, 13 kilometers, and they have data in the 79. So what I'm doing in the statistical analysis, I'm taking the series for each day, and I'm ordering it uh, for each of the cells. So I have the two components that we deal in GIS, the time and the space component. And I'm, ta I'm computing the cumulative distribution functions. Um, so in this case, for each day and for each cell in Texas, I, I can estimate how, how likely ha um, is a value of soil moisture um, if they are if they are close to the median, if they are close to the 50%, it's a common value, an expected value. Of the, if they are under the 20 percentile, if, um, that means that it's a dry value. And so the implementation of the web application. In this case, the, um, the web application consists in three uh, main areas, the client side, the cloud, and the server. In the client side, is, uh, well, each, each of us can access the application through a computer with internet access. And, but behind the scenes, um, there are two main components. One server, the server component uh, that deals with uh, the data from, from NASA. So I'm accessing the server, the web service from NASA, and there are components from a server at UT Austin. Um, at the Center for Research in Water Resources. So uh, over there I have the, the layer uh, with the, inform the latest information. And in the cloud, I'm using the Microsoft Azure Cloud. Um, I'm using the storage account, uh, storage account to store um, the statistics, the cumulative distribution that I talk about. Um, 
and I access it through uh, um, using the web app framework Django. As we mentioned before in this conference, uh, for people that don't have a, maybe a computer science background, Python is a really um, easy to use uh, language and we like to stick with it. <laughs> so enough talking and uh, I think I'm gonna do a small demo. So this is a web application that you all can access. The texasolmoisture.azurewebsites.net. And first we see that it was uh, updated last week. So we are looking at the values from uh, August uh, 13. So these are the absolute values of soil moisture uh, in millimeters. So it's a equivalent water content. So dark blue means that it's wet and uh, light blue is drier. But this, um, what we know for example that West Texas is dry, usually drier than East Texas. So in order to compare uh, uh, the values, we can see the deviation from the mean. That is an anomaly. So in this map, uh, I'm showing the anomaly from the mean. Blue values are that the anomaly is positive. I have more water than I usually have. And uh, yellow and red values are a negative anomaly that uh, I have less water than I usually have. Uh, this, this map is important because, uh, for example, for drought conditions, uh, we can estimate how much water is needed uh, to reach uh, normal conditions. But additionally to the an anomaly map, I also have the percentile map. The percentile map shows um, how common is, a, is this value compared to the historic time series. So in this case, white values are uh, normal expected values, and red values are uh, extreme dry conditions or below the 20 percentile. So in this case, if I click in the map, I can see the statistics in a pop-up. And, um, and I see two plots on the right. So on the right, sorry. So that, uh, the plot on the top right side is a cumulative distribution. So I see, um, the dotted line is the current value. So you see that it's under the 20 percentile. So it's actually the two percentile. So it's really dry right now in, in this part of West Texas. And if, if I see the bottom chart, I see the historic, I see the last 30 days. I see some rain events that happened, but uh, it didn't help to, uh, to recover good, good conditions in the soil moisture. So in other case, if I click in a point that has normal conditions, I can see this in the cumulative distribution function. And I see that um, I have normal conditions there. And I, I can track the rain events when they happen and also um, how much they influenced in the soil moisture. So going back to the slides. Ooh. All right, so the applications um, of this analysis is, for example, for extreme events. In, in one side, I have the drought. Uh, in 2011, we have a serious drought in Texas, the worst in record. Um, well, compared to the one in the 50s, it's really similar, a different scope. But if I analyze September 2011, uh, we see that uh, the 95% or 97% of the of the land in Texas was below of a five per fifth percentile. So we have extremely dry conditions that uh, can be shown with this analysis. In the other side from, ex uh, from the extreme events, we have floods. Um, also in, in, in Texas, south of Austin, we have a, a big flood uh, during the Halloween night in 2013. Okay. So, um, we can explain this uh, flood with several reasons, but one of them is that the soil was soaked with uh, water from the previous rains. So when this rain event, this storm event uh, happened, uh, the soil couldn't get more water and everything converted to runoff. So the rain, uh, the storm event was expected, but they didn't expect the, uh, having this extra runoff. Uh, just as final concluding remarks, um, Exposing these large data sets through web services uh, help 
um, not only scientists, also the public in general to realize uh, how the conditions are in their area. Also the percentiles used in the and the CFD distributions, um, I think assess a, a better way to our understanding of how dry or how wet are the conditions, um, rather to the anomaly or the of the absolute values. And well, there is um, there is more work remaining uh, in this project, um, as included more variables. Uh, the next one that I'm going to include is evapotranspiration and complete that just statistical analysis, how um, the conditions vary with space and time. Uh, well, uh, biograms depending on space and time, sorry. And the application mainly for floods and droughts. So please visit the webpage. Uh, I'm happy to receive any comments and I'll take questions afterwards and any day during the conference. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Luo Chen from NUDT China, Changsha. And our research team is focused on the technologies and the system design for higher performance geo computation. This work is supported by the National Higher Technology Research and Development Program of China, also known as 863 program. Um, the, this presentation reports our uh, design implement our implementation of a web-based system that supports efficient retrieving and online mapping of large-scale moving objects on our Linux cluster-based higher-performance geographic information system. Okay, <coughs> why we do this? We noticed that the advance of location sensor technology has enabled us to record locations of moving objects with a sequence of timestamp trajectory data. The trajectory data can be potentially used in many GIS applications, such as travel navigation, event surveillance, object activity analysis, and to build a spatial temporal map. But the performance of existing systems is not so good to satisfy the online interaction of massive moving objects. In order to improve the spatial temporal interactive effect uh, for online systems, especially in web environment, we have implemented a set of technologies for efficiently retrieving and online mapping of large-scale moving objects trajectory data. Okay. Um, by using a spatial temporal aggregation and a server-side catch techniques, we decrease the data volume that transmitted via the web and reduce the data access time in, on the server side. Experiments using over 10,000 moving objects with about 17 million location points show that our proposed approach may accelerate mapping process. We implemented the proposed methods and developed a web-based system based on our high-G system. Um, users may interactively draw rectangles at the web browser to query and map millions of moving objects in remote geospatial temporal data repositories. Now let me give a brief introduction of HiGIS system. HiGIS is a higher performance geo computation platform. It takes a HPC cluster architecture and a MPI parallel programming paradigm. Uh, as for the application architecture, it is a typical browser server model. All the functions and modules were implemented on the server side, and it is composed of three main parts. Uh, the parallel geocomputing parts, the spatial database parts, and the parallel cartel parts. Users need only to open a browser, and he or she can remotely call the parallel geocomputing tools on the server side, thus to take advantage of parallel computing. Okay, the left upper picture is the developing prototype system in our lab. Uh, it takes hardware architecture, include Blade Server, uh, PC Server clusters, and a standalone SMP server. Uh, we are testing system performance in different environments. Uh, the left lower picture 
is another system we installed in Beijing, which is consists of 10 Lenovo PC servers. The right side are several screenshots of Hygis, which was simply demonstrated yesterday evening. Okay, uh, now let's move to the mapping system. The system architecture is illustrated here, which uh, include four components. The data management module, uh, retrieving processing module, ST-Cube generation module, and the interactive visualization module. Uh, data management module received the trajectory data of moving objects. Um, and to, to reconstruct the trajectory data according to a spatial temporal data model and save it into database with the support of a high storage service. Retrieve processing module converts the spatial temporal retrieve request into structured SQL statements with spatial semantics and execute them in high system. STCube generation module aggregates retrieve results into a data structure called SDCube, which is a multi-dimensional blob and contains the selected objects in given geospatial and uh, time range. And the interactive visualization module is designed and implemented for sending retrieval requests um, for spatial temporal data cubes and displaying the cubes as dynamic maps in web browser as well as to offer a variety of flexible retrieval methods. Since massive amount of uh, moving objects are difficult for mapping online, to reduce the huge volume of mapping data that were transmitted via the web, we proposed a data structure called SDCube to use aggregation techniques for spatial uh, generalization and abstraction for of moving object data set. The method is based on calculating the integration of a location point in a tile area. The aggregation result conveys essential characteristics of the movement, such as the number of cars during a given time period. The degree of the aggregation can be controlled through a set of parameters. The semantics uh, structure of SDCube is described above. The basic idea of STCube is to reorganize moving objects into a set of hierarchical spatial temporal units, just like a spatial temporal grid index. And the whole STCube is divided into a number of cubes, and each cube is subsequently divided into a set of grids. And uh, each grid contains a series of integral value of moving objects during the corresponding time unit. The construction of SD cube is consists of five major steps as in the slide. And this is the abstract data structure of our SD cube in the program in the programming language. Mm -hmm. Moreover, we found that the construction of SD cube is also a relatively time consuming task, especially for some fixed query uh, of interest, such as tell me how the taxis of Beijing were moving during Spring Festival 2014, or how the taxis were moving of each weekend in July 2014. Since the same queries were issued many times, we needn't calculate the, the um, result again and again for different users, so we set a catch in server side and uh, do pre-calculation of SDCube according to typical query template, and save the result into the catch. Each time um, the mapping query issued, uh, we first check uh, the, chat, uh, the catch to find if the result is already in it. If so, the result in, each ca in catch will be returned first. Also, there is a, a mechanism to update the catch to make it correct. All the catch maintaining mechanism mechanism maintaining routine could be parallel. Thus, uh, we cut down the I.O. time and the computer time of reading data and the calculating from the trajectory database. Mm. But the control of the catch is also a difficult task. Our team 
um, is still working on to make the catch more efficiency. Mm. Here is our implementation interfaces. Our experimental data comes from a Microsoft T Drive project. Uh, a, subset of, a subset of the data set is, consists of 10,123 taxis GPS trajectory data in a week, uh, in a continu continuous seven days within Beijing. And the total number of the points is nearly 17 million. This is the dynamic mapping interface, and uh, this is an interactive query um, interface. P users may draw a rectangle on the interface and uh, get a result back. And uh, this is the op uh, moving object identification um, interface. Well, this is our work. We hope this method will improve the effect of online curing and interaction of massive moving objects in relative scenarios. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Xiao Wen if he's in the audience. Do we want to take a few minutes for questions? I know right now we've got about 45 minutes available for lunch, so I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who can answer whether that's enough or not. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to? Okay. So I, I actually want to thank all of our presenters for setting the bar high for lightning. It's really interesting talks, very timely. You didn't have to pull anyone off the stage. Excellently done. You've set the bar high for everyone else. So uh, if our presenters just kind of want to stand up here since we'll do this quickly, do we have questions for any of the presenters uh, from the last 50 minutes? Yes. Uh, I'll just repeat it. Yeah, go ahead. Could you repeat the question, repeat the question. too? For the yes, I think you, you, you asked me the, is the ST cube indexed in some tree structure or in something? Like TPR3, like yeah. Uh, we haven't uh, made it, it, it is just um, and about a corner tree structure. It's not a TPR structure now. So we are, so our team is working on it to make it more efficient. We, we found uh, when the catch, the SD cube catch um, is working, it becomes very big. So we are cutting down. So we, we, are, we are doing something um, to, to find a correct or suitable index on the SD cube especially in the catch. Okay. <laughs>